Hey everyone, my name is O, and we are going to talk about generalization in deep learning. So I was attracted by the first sentence of the abstract from this paper, and the, it the first sentence says, "This paper explains why deep learning can generalize well." So I guess this is really interesting to everyone. Let's take a look what did the paper says. So before we dive into the paper, let's give some background introduction and recap what are the existing generalization theory. So before we're talking about everything, I think we should give a formal definition of generalization. So what is a generalization? A generalization usually considering a generalization bound. Generalization bound is saying that you have a data set SM. And then the SM is from the this unknown distribution, and you have a L to be a loss function when you when you try to learn a hypothesis from the data sets and by using the algorithm algorithm A, and then you can you can say that let's say that there is a expected risk, which is the loss value across the entire distribution. The expect expectation value of the loss function's output across the entire distribution D, and then you can do the same thing on the dataset SM you have. Then let we say that this is the empirical risk. So the generalization bound is usually considering the expected risk and minus the empirical risk. That's generalization bound. And informally. And we say the hypothesis is a function that you learned, and a hypothesis set is all possible function you can learn. And the generalization is the knowledge you want to learn, and the generalization band is basically according to our experiment, and it's the test error minus training error if you choose a right loss function. All right, so this is a um, very intuitive informal. Intuitive information, uh, information for the generalization. So the goal of the generalization, well, what did the generalization theory wants to do? The ba the first role of the generalization theory is about g giving a expected risk guarantee, which is saying that you are estimating your testing error. Let's say you have a model and you have a data set, then can you estimate? Estimate the test error before your training, right? So and then the second row of the generalization theory is saying that um, you have a model uh, or you have a data set, uh, and you have a data set. Then let's say how can you guarantee your generalization's quality? For example, uh, the bound quality. Then you train your model on the data set, and then you can. How can you guarantee your test error is smaller than something, right? So basically, it also can understanding as uh, you are determining a good model from 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 this bound, right? From the test error minus training error, right? So the third rule of the generalization theory is saying that when you already know that your model is good. And you already know you will have a bad, bad um, you will have a good performance from from your data set. And then, how can you achieve the optimal weights rapidly or fast, right? So that those are the three different uh, guarantee, uh, three different uh, goal from of the generalization theory, right? And then informally, the generalization theory is all about the test error minus training error equals to what? That's the bigger question, right? So, what's the force of generalization theory? So, in the traditional Weistrom and the traditional theory says, and you have a Occam's razor, you have a no free no free lunch theory, and you have something called the algorithm algorithmic Stability and robustness, and you have a flat region. Can you know that the flat region will generate better? This is a empirical risk. 
empirical results. And then the paper, which is uh, from ICLR 2017, and from Zhang, and he empirically shows that three different conclusions as deep learn deep models generate via memorization. So he claims that all different or deep models generate well because of it remembers everything. This is a really strong claim. Mm, we will discuss it, about it later in theory. And then the second one, he says the explicit regularization, for example, the L2 weight normalization is unnecessary. Uh, and then the third one is about the implicit regularization. Implicit regularization such as the algorithm, SGD, which is can influence your generalization. So he basically he is saying that you should uh, combine the uh, model complexity theory and the um, algorithm complexity theory, right? So this is what this paper is saying. I compare this two different traditional wisdom and and the paper from Zhang, and you can see there is a parent paradox. And why deep learning sometimes generates well? Desperate is large capacity, stability, and non robustness, or a sharp minimum. Yeah, that's 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 a really interesting question. So they they are sit, sit uh, standing in the opposite side. So, what what this paper is going to explain is we will go into decomposite the generative theory and understanding when did the generation failure. So, before we dive into the paper, let's review the entire uh, traditional theory. For example, the model complexity. So, the traditional theory uses uh, use the VC dimension to measure how a model is complex. So basically it says when your model become more complex than others, then your complexity term will increase. And then your capacity becomes large and then your training error becomes small and your testing error, uh, your test error is smaller than the training error plus some complexity term. So when your complexity increases, then your test error somehow from some point will increase again. Okay, so they basically are saying that you don't want choosing a model that is too small, it's underfitting the data, and then you don't want to choose a model that is too complex, then test error and training error becomes very large. Okay, and then if you observe this, if you know the VC dimension, then you probably know that VC dimension is data independent. So what what did people what did the research do researchers do is to they propose the random anchor complexity, and the random anchor complexity is saying that how what's the ability that a model fit random labels. The red marker complexity is saying that. If if the red marker complexity is really high, then it's saying that your model, sh your your hypothesis set, is has a really good ability to fit random labels. This is some measurement about the complexity in in another way. Okay, and if you heard about something from the traditional series, then you probably know that, uh, you, from for a neural network or a deep net. And the VC dimension is basically equal to the number of parameters. Okay, so this uh, it's basically saying that your VC bound is smaller than something plus smaller than the empirical risk, which is the training error, is smaller than the training error plus the number some term regarding the number of parameters. So you, if you have a really large, a uh, really complex model, then your your penalty term will be really large, then the test error should not will not be good, right? So informally, the model complexity series says that 
the test error is smaller than the training error plus complexity penalty. Okay, so this is the first theory, and then people also proposed that for the algorithmic stability and the robustness. For example, if you look at this graph here, then it basically says when you have the two different label data, labeled data, and you have a class classifier here, a line, for example, the SVM. So once once you remove one data point, then your hyperplane of your SVM model will be shifted, right? So the rope the stability theory is basically studying that study how the hyperplane will be shifted and if you remove a uh, one single data point then if the hyperplane removes uh, moves really large or is really sensitive then your algorithm is not that much good so that's basically what that's basically what algorithmic stability is saying so in the same way you have a uh, robustness the robustness is doesn't uh, considering one single single data point, but it considering a part of the data set. So if you considering a part uh, a partial of the data set, and you remove it or apply it to another, then what what would the what would the hyperplane moves? So it's basically this this two different series saying that the test error is smaller than the training error plus some algorithm planity. Okay? These are the two and the second or the or and the third series says. And the last series is not recently proposed, but the recently people realized it's important because people somehow observed that the set point is exponentially large than a minimum, the number of minima. People observed that, for example, if you check the ResNet, you have a like something like the significant drop here. And why ResNet? If you read this paper, then you probably know that your with a skip connection, then your loss surface, loss landscape, uh, landscape is really smooth then you can easily observe this kind of phenomenon then you have a significant drop which means that you are going down to the bottom and somehow you stuck in some stationary point here for example the flat region here and then it, for a long time training here is a significant drop and then it somehow in, implies here so this is this somehow suggesting that suggesting that the flat region tend to be generated well. Okay, so this is a conjecture and it's from an empirical observation, and and it doesn't give any theoretical proof. So this is this might be an interesting uh, theory. Okay, and that's uh, everything regarding the. Uh, old series. Let's uh, now let's dive into the paper. So, wh what what's the ori uh, origin of the paradox we talked about before? So, in model complexity theory, it says let's consider two uh, two propositions. So let's say P is uh, is model complexity is appropriate small, and Q is saying that your generalization gap. Is more okay. So in model complex in model complexity theory, it says the p implies q, right? And which means the generalization gap becomes small if the model complexity is appropriately small. However, if you closely look at John's paper, it basically says. Okay, we observe the Q, then we should have P. It says Q in plus P. This is not like the how logic works, right? So it's saying that uh, your condition and your conclusion is reversed, has a reversed position in John's paper. So what they, what, what, what he did, 
uh, concluded is basically a nonsense. For example, this deep learning generates well over memorization. Yeah, you, you, he is true about few models, but not all of them. Okay, so this is a wrong conclusion here. And it, from this observation, you basically know that okay, the traditional theory doesn't apply to deep learning directly. Okay, so what did the author do in this paper? He proves the following bound here, and I'm not going to talk about this formula detailly. Then I will directly showing what did uh, what did this formula do. So it basically says then you let's considering your practice scenario. Then you have a data set and you uh, split your data set to uh, to a training data and a validation data. So you train your network based on your training data and validate your network via validation set. And on validation set, you have uh, accuracy here, so which is uh, uh, validation error. And then the planity depends on the hypothesis set, the, uh, the size of your hypothesis set of your validation set. So it basically says you are seeking for some model from your validation model or not from your training model, okay? So it's basically saying that your validation model guarantees the good test error. Yeah, okay. So in this formula, you, you significant, you obviously observe that your generalization bound is independent with what kind of algorithm you are using and it's independent with what kind of loss function you are using right so that's basically this empirical risk guarantee is saying that you are asking estimating your test error by your validation set okay let's take a look at an example so if you considering MNIST or a uh, cipher 10 then your training example here should be 10,000, right? Then the delta is something called the confidence. So it basically, if you want a high confidence, then you should pay for your confidence and increase your bound here. For example, if you have a really slow delta, then your LN term will be really large, then it increases your entire term. Right, this is this is intuitive. So in, you you don't need to know what c and gamma is, but in this is a really worst case for this formula. And let's say your hypothesis class it should be one billion, and then your testing error is smaller than your validation error plus six uh, or seven percent, right? So it basically says. Your MNIST or Cypher 10, it's always get a good result. This is what we practice uh, a lot. You probably won't get some uh, accuracy lower than 90%, right? You by using a neural network, and then in this theorem, it says the MNIST or Cypher 10 always get a good result because of the validation hypothesis set is really small okay would that make sense all right so if you are really smart then you probably notice that your fr for, for or, or saying that your the size of your validation model is not calculable because it's infinite right it's it you you can't say that your set is a finite it's infinite set, right? So this this bound could be some could could be vacuous because you you don't know this term, you don't know the F bar, you don't know what's the value of F bar, okay? So so also considering this issue, he proposed a definition. For example, here he, he is claiming that you should have a data set. The paper proves that this proves a bound 
here, like this one. And this bound is basically says the deep network is strongly dependent on the quality of your data set. Okay, so it 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 says you you definitely need your data set to be good, then you achieve a best accuracy here. So in this definition, you you can observe that you have beta one, beta two, and beta three. Those these two different constants, and then you base the definition is saying that this three different constants is measuring how a dataset is good or not. And if you closely look at this definition, then you probably notice that what 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 you see. C is basically something, some function of the model and your input feature x, and then y is your label of your dataset. So this is kind of definition from from this paper. This is not this is not trivial. This is non-trivial, right? Why why does the dataset looks like this? Why you should define your concentrated dataset looks like this? This is all because of this bound. So if you have this bound, then you will have this two, three different term. Then if your data set to be good, then your beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3 to become small, then your bound is relatively small. Okay? So when you have this bound, when you successfully measured your data set's quality, then you can exactly measure how how your generalizations what's your generalization quality here. Okay? So in short, the from this bound you can basically observe that your test error minus training error is equal to some constant. Of your model and your data set. Okay? So because beta 1, beta 2, beta 3 is the data set, and the weights is rely on the model. So, and you, with, with this kind of formula, you can determine the data set quality. Why? Because you can, you can start training your entire network, and then you, you can empirically observe this, this value, the test error minus training error. And then you know the weights, right? If you know the weights, then you know the alpha, beta, and the gamma, and how, uh, and you know the beta one, beta two, and beta three. Yeah. So this is a data dependent bound. And then, so also saying that you have a data dependent bound. Then how about the data independent bound? What if I only have a model? Then I will, um, I am interested in um, this model is good performing across the uh, all different data sets. How the model works with the different data set instead of this specific task. So the, the author studied the property of STD and proposed two phase training. So the pe so the two phase training is basically saying that your first phase is standard phase, which is you train the entire network in a standard way, and with the a partial data partial data set, right? So the alpha is the ratio that you take how much partial of the data set. Let's say you have a zero point five, then you take the half of the data set to standardly in, to train the network in a standard way. Okay, and then. Once you finish the standard phase, there are some weights to already become zero. So, for the weights already become zero, we are not interested in. And for the weights are not zero, then we know that it's kind of activation pattern. For example, these gray lines are the weights already become zero, but the, the green lines is something that Weights are not equal to zero, then you keep training with the rest of the network and then with the rest of the data set. Okay? So the all 
The author, Kenji Kawaguchi, provided his experiment on this two-phase training. If you observe this graph, then you would say, you would observe that the amnist, you looking for the weights with a really small data size of the data set, and then you keep training with the rest of the network, with the rest of the data set, and then you have a really competitive result here, right? Because with alpha approaching to zero, then your standard, the, your number of your sample in the standard phase is relatively small. Okay, so, but for cipher 10, it decreases about 9%, uh, about 8%. It's not that much large than, let's say, it's competitive. So the experiment basically says the small alpha can achieve a competitive performance. And why we need this kind of two-phase training? Because we need this in data independent bound. So the data independent bound is based on this two-phase training. And with this two-phase training, the weights can also be bounded. Because if you if you look at the first bound, the data dependent bound, you you might say here the you might see here the weights already depend on the number of the weights and already depend on the weights how weights are good, right? So with this two phase training and the data independent bound is independent with the number of the parameters. It's independent with uh, individual weights. It only depends on the overall weights. It's, it only depends on the bound of the weights. Okay, so with this kind of uh, theorem, then it basically says the test error minus training error is equal to some constant of the model. Okay, so you you the so only thing influence your test error minus uh, minus training error is your model. It, it doesn't rely on your what kind of algorithm you are using and doesn't rely on what kind of uh, loss factor you are choosing. It only depends on your model. Okay? So with this formula, you can basically determine your model is good or not. So let's take a look at it. two examples. So the first example says the you consider in cipher 10, the cipher 10 has five, uh, 50 thousand examples, and then your output classifi uh, classi classify classes, classification classes is 10. And in a worst case, the, you don't need to know what kind of this formula, uh, this kind of notion mean, but this is a worst case, you, you should know that. And then you with two phase training, and let's say the alpha you use. 90% samples for the freeze phase and 10% for the standard phase. And then with 90% confidence, then you will calculate your generalizing bound is to 25%. It's not good, but when you can, sh you can control these two different variables here, this is controllable by the two-phase training, then you can have a really, really small accurate again, error here, and the testing error minus training error. You will have a really small generation bound. Okay, that's basically everything about the bound of generalization in this paper. So what, what did the author do is he proposed the DARC regularizer based on this different bound and the DRC, what, what, what is a DRC uh, uh, regularizer? The name is Directly Approximately Regularizing Complexity Family and it basically considering the red marker complexity and your red marker complexity measures the ability to fit random labels if you minimize this kind of ability, then you actually improve your model's performance, right? 
So the author suggesting that you are you should somehow add your red mark red mark complexity to your origin loss, and then the simplest version of the uh, DRC regularizer is kind of like this one. So you don't need you don't really need to know read the formula because I I can tell you what uh, how can we implement it in, in Keras. So in Keras you have your model here and you took the output from last layer and you calculated the absolute value and then sum every dimension and calculate the maximum value of the uh, of all them across all dimensions and times the lambda is the and times the lambda is the hyperparameter for this regularizer and also gives his results here and you say that the baseline is the state of the art error and the DRC divided by the baseline is equal to some value that's smaller than one which means DRC's test error which test error is smaller than the base model here so it basically says it improves and improves the state of the art and you observe this kind of standard uh, standard value here then you might say that okay then it's pretty much stable okay it's time to sum up so if you don't understand what I'm saying here what I'm saying about this paper it's totally fine I'm already read you some conclusion here so this paper is all about the testing error smaller than the training error plus some model and data penalty and independent with all what kind of algorithm you are using and the in independent with all the kind of loss function you are using it's independent with what kind of flat rating you are using okay so it basically says that only your model architecture and the data set matters your test error minus training error. That's that's everything matters. Okay, so this is the core conclusion from this paper. And you know that we talk a, a little bit about the traditional theory. Then you should from this talk you should know that the traditional theory failed to explain the generalization for the over parameterized model. And then the general the deep network can generate well because it's large hypothesis capacity, right? And it's because of the small validation hypothesis class search, and it the bound is independent with the number of parameters. It's independent with the number of weights. You can keep stack your model to the infinite. And for a specific task, the generalization gap it depends on your model and your data set it's independent with your what kind of algorithm you are using and in general your test error minus training error it only depends on your model architecture so basically you don't need to waste your time on your algorithm and keep increasing keep improving your model architecture keep improving your data set it's the best way do not always switch in different algorithm because algorithm loss doesn't influence you well at all. And to achieve that, I also also proposed the DRC regularization family. And this kind of regularization term helps you how to, how to generalize rapidly. Okay, that's everything about this paper. See you next time.